Set? Yes, Marshala, yes. All right, great. I don't know what to do about the landscape setting. I'm going to try to learn that because I was having a bit of a problem with the other projection as well. So if anybody knows about that, let me know. Somebody had said na, that maybe they, they use it on the phone. Maybe if they can come on a laptop or something, then the view will be a little larger. If that is a possibility. Yeah, you can ask. I will, inshallah. Okay, finally. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, which rosa is it? How is it going? Yeah. What is your general routine? And uh, Zoom people can simply type and I'll just kind of pay attention here as well if you don't mind. So, what is your general routine, anybody, if you want to share? So, I, uh, I go for my uh, circuit juice in the morning. Okay. Uh, you, so, you, sorry. I go to my class. The circuit juice you're doing is the afternoon at the friend's place. Okay, you do the 38 juice in the morning. In the morning. Okay, and mashallah. Then I go home. I take a little nap. And that's like early morning that you do? No, that's 11.30. Okay. So 11. I 11.30, 12.30, but I wake up by 9. Okay, so I'm mentally present. Uh -huh. So, first of all, I'm supposed to study the mock sake, which I don't deny. I'm very excited to come here, so I get up by two, I get up, then I come here. Then I go home, I prepare a and then after a I go to my tarabe. So okay, Alhamdulillah. Busy day. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. I think this is a time to have a busy day that way. Yeah. yeah. And then are, are you all going for tarabi or do you do tarabi at home? How does it work for you? You're going for tarabi? Okay. Or And some of you are doing tarabi at home? Okay. Alhamdulillah, that's great. Whatever works for you, you know. Sometimes it's wonderful because when you don't know that much Quran. And by, in Tarawi, by the way, you can hold the Quran and read it. Right. right. But again, if you're not familiar with the Quran, then even holding it and reading it gets to be a big challenge. Because you get lost, you don't know, you don't know if the pronunciation is correct. You know, there are quite a few issues. So for that reason, listening to Tilawa is, uh, is always a good idea. Alhamdulillah. So yeah, Alhamdulillah. But special routines in Ramadan are always very good to have. And Alhamdulillah, I feel that people like us who have the luxury, actually, of sitting in a Quran session or going for two Quran sessions or, or classes during Ramadan is such an extra mercy of Allah on us because majority of people in this dunya don't ever forget, have to work and earn a living and they don't have the luxury like we do. So if people like us don't make an effort to come out yeah, and uh, be with the Quran, right? And uh, Fareen was actually uh, sent me a message uh, uh, in the afternoon and she said that, you know, uh, if you think that it is feasible, you can say to people that the benefit of actually sitting in a live class is a lot more than being on Zoom. That, that's a fact that you, you cannot deny that. In Zoom, uh, during COVID and uh, during the uh, lockdowns, uh, Alhamdulillah, it was an absolute mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we had an option to go to. But given a choice, it is always best to be on site with each other, right? We have this, you know, we look at each other. We kind of talk, and, and, and as a speaker or as a teacher, let me tell you, you feed off your students. Otherwise, when you're talking, you know, to the atmosphere, whatever, huh? Yeah. 
Yep. It is a completely different story. Yeah. It is. That's right. Absolutely. So I hope that the uh, Zoom people are listening to this because there are several Zoom people who are in Karachi. So they're not all uh, uh, somewhere else, right? So yeah, the experience is quite something. And uh, uh, for those of you who are in Karachi, maybe drop in one day and see what happens. No, I'm serious. This is a very serious suggestion, but it's entirely up to you. But uh, yeah, you can. Uh, somebody, Maryam Faisal Amin is saying, I read Quran after Fajr, after Zuhar. Prepare for Aftari after that. Read Quran, Zikr, then Aftar. Alhamdulillah. You're right. We're all blessed. Yes. Allah ka shukar ihsan. Seriously. Now, um, so yeah. And then when we are blessed, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this opportunity and this ni'mah, that means what? That means that we are going to be asked about it. We are going to be asked about it. That Ramadan May, you had all of these opportunities. So what did you do? Right? Were you up all night and then sleeping all day after Fajr? If you're fasting and doing that and not missing your salahs, alhamdulillah, that's also not a bad deal, to be honest. But the fact is that we should grab as much as opportunity as possible. Okay. Without further ado, I'm sorry, I got this uh, realigned my laptop. So the man has, uh, uh, you know, he, he kind of rebooted the whole thing. So my Arabic typesetting font has gone. So some of the Arabic might come a little. Uh, crazy in there so I'll try to get it fixed before tomorrow so but just bear with that for for today yeah this is only for you guys the zoom people are good to go yeah okay in alhamdulillah ya rabbi laka alhamdu hatta tarda wa laka alhamdu idha ma radit wa laka alhamdu ba'da rida wa laka alhamdu ala kulli hal allahumma laka alhamdu hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fih alhamdulillah الذي أنزل على أبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحيم يا ذا الجلال والإكرام noticed or will notice later on, I sometimes say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha, and sometimes I say, Nashhadu Allah ilaha. The difference is if I say, Ashhadu Allah, that means I bear witness. When I say, Nashhadu Allah, that means we bear witness. Okay? So there's a difference in the pronoun, which makes it singular or plural. All right? Uh, just in case somebody noticed, because I think I said, Nashhadu yesterday, and I, I do that sometimes. I don't know why, it just kind of, whatever flows. All right, so just to clarify that. Okay, Ji. Alhamdulillah, yesterday, what we did was that we saw the um, lineage of uh, uh, Yusuf alayhi salam in quite a bit of detail. And we talked about the fact that our position in the Akhira is not established at all by where we are born, because that is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us. We haven't. Our lineage is, has got nothing to do with me. Who my parents are, I didn't choose my parents, right? But I can choose my friends. There are certain choices in this dunya that I am born with, which are not my choices. That is what Allah's, like for example, our socioeconomic position, majority of the time. All of us, like I said, sitting in this room are and uh, on Zoom as well, are terribly privileged, aren't we? We are very privileged. What has that got to do with me? Not much, right? We live in Karachi, Pakistan. Every day we drive by and we are sitting in the car and there's a woman or a child or a man on the other side asking for money. Now you can say, oh, they are professional beggars. <laughs> Nevertheless, even if they are professional beggars, 
Is that their choice that they are on the outside and my choice that I'm on the inside? Nay na. Allah has given me that privilege. So that is what we discussed yesterday in great detail. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins uh, uh, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam uh, formally, so to speak, when Yusuf alayhi salam sees a dream. Yeah, we, talk, we, we, we talked about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If Allah Yusufu li, Yusufu li abihi ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban wa shamsa wal qamar wa shamsa wal qamar ra'aytuhum li sajideen. Oh, my father, Ya Abati is a very beautiful and a very polite, the politest possible way of saying, Oh, my dear father. Yeah, a very polite way of saying. I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and I saw them all doing sajda to me, prostrating to me before me. Right? So, Yusuf alayhi salam sees this dream. And how old is Yusuf? We talked about that before, approximately seven years old. And please understand that when the, uh, the Mufassirun, the ones who do the tafsir of the Quran, when they talk about ages of say prophets or uh, past nations, you know, it's an approximation. You can't know 100% for sure. They will take a few, few uh, uh, years here and there. So he, uh, Yusuf alayhi salam is repeating this verb. If you look at it, ra'ayta, ra'ayta. First he's saying, I saw, Right? And then he's saying again that I saw that they're doing sajda to me. Do you see that? Do you see that on your screen? Uh, Ra'aytu over here. And then he's saying again, Ra'aytuhum. Twice. So what scholars say is that first he begins with the dream that this is what I saw. First that happens. And then he's like, oh my God, now they're prostrating. So it's like, even in the dream, he sees this twice. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we actually go on to the uh, tafsir of this ayah, right? We really need to have a little bit of discussion about dreams, right? It's very important because Yusuf alayhi salam's uh, experience with dreams is very profound and phenomenal, really. And a lot of Surah Yusuf, quite a bit of it, deals with how he interpreted dreams later on as well. Okay. And this is a topic which sometimes we find super interesting and we get all kinds of information from here and there and we're not quite sure what is the correct uh, sort of Islamic view on that, to put it this way. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that nothing has been left of Nabuwa. We know that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's going to be no prophet, period. Right, it's over and done with. He is the last prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he is saying himself that nothing is left of Nabuwa except Mubashirat, right? Mubashirat. And um, somebody asked him that, Ya Rasulullah, what is Mubashirat? So he said, uh, uh, it is a dream that you see, and he specifically said that you might be in it, or somebody sees a dream with you in it. Okay. That's what he said. So, so that is either you or somebody else sees you in it. Now, Rasulullah has told us that there are many, many ahadiths are related to dreams. Yeah. So Rasulullah, I'm not going to quote all of them over here, but whatever information is gathered over here is based on that. Right. So Rasulullah has told us that uh, Uh, good dreams come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bad dreams come from shaitan. If anyone sees a bad dream that scares him, let him spit dryly to his left and seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from its evil, then it will do him no harm. Okay. So from various different ahadiths, we find out that there are actually three types of dreams that human beings can experience, right? And everybody actually dreams. Everybody dreams. Do you guys generally remember your dreams? Yeah, not, always. not always. Mostly you do remember? Achha, okay, that's interesting. Because let's see what the three categories of dreams are. Yeah, okay. Um, there are dreams from our imagination, right? Which is called hadith or nafs. I think this imagination has, has gone from here because of the font problem over here today. But hadith al-nafs is something which is from our imagination. This is from us, from our own nafs, 
from our own mind, from our own, yeah, from our own thinking, right? And the other type is called Holm, which is a nightmare, what we call nightmare. It's too bright for you guys, but yeah. This is our imagination, that's right. Yeah, and for, for those of you who are sitting in the classroom, what I'm going to do is, inshallah ta'ala, I think Rohefa will manage to do that. We'll share these presentations with you so you guys have the, the exact points in front of you. That, that, that won't be a problem. And the third type of dreams, which are called either Mubashara or Ruya, Ruya as well, from look, see, Ra'a means to see, Ruya, these are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are three different types of dreams. So um, uh, scholars say that you have nafsiyati dreams from your own nafs, then you have shaitani dreams, which are those nightmares, and then you have ruhani dreams, which are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is how they kind of categorize it, right? Um, now the prophets don't get the other two types of dreams, any nightmares or hadiths or nafs. They only get dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are part of the wahi that they have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So Allah has protected the prophets, all of the prophets, from the dreams from shaitan. Yeah, that is a special protection given to the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every time of prophet sees a dream, it is a revelation and it is a wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We have already seen that in the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. If those of you who know in the story of Ibrahim a little bit, Ibrahim alayhi salam saw a dream that he was slaughtering his son. That was a dream. And that was something which was absolutely 100% true, right? So uh, it is possible that regular people, non-prophets, get a dream which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is very much possible. So it is not exclusively for the prophets. It is possible, but it is very rare. Let's put it this way as well. Because, because we love to talk about dreams and all, so we are like, oh, you know, but aaj to Allah se hi baat ho gayi. You know, so we need to be very, very careful for ourselves or for other people because this is a, this is another one of those topics which is now if I say it in Urdu, these two people are going to be offended, but there is no other way to explain this chaska topic. What do you what do you call chaska in English? Maza, uh, no, maza Urdu, hai na? How would you explain chaska in English? It's like a yeah, it's like a yeah, it's like a addict, it's it's like indulgent addiction. Uh, sorry, <laughs> okay, right. So, um, we like to do that, we like to kind of think uh, too much of the dreams and make all kinds of ta'wil interpretations, right? So, when we get this clarified, inshallah, we will see what it's all about. So, hadith al nafs, the first category, if you want to talk about that. If, for example, you want a very fancy car. Right? Or you're dreaming about a holiday, right? Or you're making plans about something, or you are having your exams. These days, a lot of kids are having exams time. So you might go to sleep and you will be having that kind of dream. So that is from your nafs. That is one way that this is Hadith will nafs your imagination. Sometimes people say you know, that if you watch certain types of movies, yeah, and if you watch certain types of stuff, you dream about it. You become that Disney princess. That is from your nafs, from your own imagination, right? That's got nothing to do with shaitan or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, everything has got something to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that is basically a dream from your nafs. And uh, there are actually special groups of scientists who are studying dreams. Yeah, it's so, 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 it's so cool to know that there's a group of people who say, I sleep on the job <laughs> and they're getting paid for it. So they literally do that. So what they say is that there is a phase in our sleep which is called the REM phase, rapid eye movement phase. And that is when everybody dreams at that stage of your sleep, yeah? And the signs of this dream are that when you wake up, it is absolutely fresh, but then it kind of melts away. Then it doesn't stay, right? So this is an indication that this is from your imagination. It could stay a little bit, you know, but it doesn't kind of persist. A lot of times people say, no, no, I don't remember what I dreamt about, yeah? And external impulses also affect this type of dream. So if somebody throws water at you, you might dream that you're drowning, 
somebody is wake yeah it happens right somebody is uh, 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 waking you up your alarm clock goes off for fajr and you have this wrong, 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 wrong thing in your head whatever so it feels like somebody is calling you or something is going on yes have any of you had anesthesia for any kind of a surgery or something the same kind of feeling you have when you are coming out of it almost you know you you, you can hear like a, like a voice is coming from a tunnel kind of a thing so there are external impulses which do affect these kind of uh, uh dreams and that is perfectly okay that's not something sometimes if you have experienced that and you feel oh my god i think a jinn is after me no this happens to everybody yeah it's okay right so it 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 is something which is very normal it is something that all human beings experience okay and this type of dream has nothing to do with good or bad it is just your imagination and the sign is that you don't remember it at all right <clears throat> okay then the other kind holm which we call nightmare in english or an evil dream um this type of dream is 100% from shaitan right it is from shaitan so the sign of this dream is that it terrifies you you're very scared that's why it's a nightmare yeah and uh, a lot of times uh, there are scholars who say that you know these uh, uh, horror movies that uh, that you see and that, that they make a lot of it is based on truth actually and they kind of obviously exaggerated to to the hilt and whatever but these are human experiences with nightmares or with jinn that have been <clears throat> you know kind of made into celluloid uh, whatever fantasy and they add elements of fantasy to it as well obviously so it's not like 100% true yeah so you see something evil or something disgusting it could be both you know for example you see that a loved one or you yourself have died a miserable death you see somebody being tortured right or uh, you see yourself being chased by something evil or aliens or you know like these and people love love to talk about these dreams so i'm not even going to ask you whether you've had a dream like that or not because it is from shaitan right Th these kind of dreams and um what scholars tell us is based on what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said was that this is basically shayateen simply making a fool out of you irritating you getting the best out of you kind of so to speak they are playing a practical joke on you right why simply because you are human and this could happen to believers and non believers it's not exclusively just for muslims it could happen to any human being right um <clears throat> these types of dreams and you can underline that if you want are never ever true they're not true so there's no point in dwelling upon them that oh my god i saw my child you know being horribly mutilated or something now subhanallah may allah protect us and then you get get all paranoid and you're like oh my god now i need to go to some suit there to find me some kind of a taweez to to protect my child you know it it actually works out to you know if you go around that route then that's where it leads you to all kinds of um, practices which are completely outside of the sharia and completely which are negated and prohibited by rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is why it is important to talk about it that these dreams are not true this is shaitan messing you up messing your head up right and um, nobody should believe these dreams nobody should believe these nightmares rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam categorically said you should not tell your nightmare to anybody don't talk about it yeah if you see an evil dream why because shaitan is fooling with you don't say it to anybody once a man came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said ya rasulullah i saw my head cut off in a dream and it was rolling like a ball and i am running after it to pick it up yeah rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said don't tell other people shaitan has played a trick on you last night and he's laughing at you right now because you are relating it so don't let him get the better of you yeah and what is the sign of this dream that you wake up terrified or you're sweating and you wake up and it happens actually it does happen that you're like terrified and you can't sometimes even explain it that why did i wake up in the middle of the night all sweaty and you know your mouth is dry and you have physical signs of that nightmare on you as well right 
So another type of dream, which is, which is from shaitan, is something which is known as ikhtilam in, the Arabic, uh, in, in Arabic, which we call in English a wet dream, right? So if you have that, and that is something which men and women both have, and there is a hadith where the Sahabi, uh, uh, lady Sahabi, she goes to Aisha ta'ala an to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about a wet dream. Yeah. Uh, and one little thing before I continue is that we watch all kinds of trash and rubbish on television or on our thing. Even in social media, we have all kinds of weird stuff, right? And when it comes to very important things in our deen, like for example, I'm talking about a wet dream, you're like, astaghfirullah haram. It's something, no, no, that, that is a tendency. We're never going to tell our children about it. Oh my God. So they can get all kinds of education or all kinds of information from somewhere else. This is an important part of our deen and I'll tell you why. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to, to her, yes, women also have bad dreams. And when you do and get up, you need to tell ghusl. That is the important part of it. Na? That you need to tell ghusl, you need to have this uh, uh, purification, right? And it is something which is not your fault because it does happen to people. One thing that it only happens to guys, no, it happens to women as well. And what you do is any, any, any dream of a vulgar nature where you feel that some discharge has happened, you need to take ghusl. That is the ruling, the fifth ruling on it, right? Very, very important, right? And the dream is from shaitan. And there is no sin on you because you do not control your dreams. When you are in a state of unwakefulness, then your, your, your faculties are not in your control. That is from shaitan. Right? But one must understand that why is it that it is so important to be careful about what you watch, what you hear, what you say, right? Because these are all the places where ideas, information, stuff goes inside of us. Right? And whatever is inside of us is something either which is attractive to shaitan or something which is repulsive to shaitan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that shaitan puts his uh, mouth, kind of so to speak, in the heart of a believer. If he sees Allah or the dhikr of Allah, he goes away. And if he doesn't, then he comes and sits there. So then he's controlling you, right? So he's controlling you in a lot of ways because you're allowing him that access. You allow the access. He can't, he can't come uh, forcefully, right? You allow that access. But important point for us is that if you do have a wet dream, then and you see discharge, then you must take ghusl, right? And those of you who have no idea how to take ghusl, whether it is after janaba or whether this is one of the uh, 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 the, the, the discharge of uh, a wet dream is one of the conditions of janaba. Right? If you don't, please come to me later. And for those of you who are on Zoom, we will inshallah, inshallah, tell you the exact or share with you the process of how to take a ghusl after menstruation for women and after uh, uh, janaba for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's important because your uh, tahara is part of your uh, very important part of our deen and our worship is dependent on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, none of the prophets, of course, had ikhtilam simply because they were protected from uh, uh, shaitan, uh, a special mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, scholars say that a lot of people go through this. So this is nothing to feel a issue about that, oh my God, I'm a dirty person or I'm so sinful, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you should ask for it as well or wish that, Achha. so maybe that should, I haven't experienced that. And you know, I'm serious because sometimes people want to have all kinds of experiences. So if you haven't, Alhamdulillah, no problem. Also, if you wake up in the middle of the night, freezing cold, that is also from shaitan. Sometimes you wake up sweating. Sometimes you wake up freezing cold in safe cold weather, cold weather. That can also happen. Yeah. So this is another type of evil dream. Once again, we don't tell people about it. We simply do osal. Right? Seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't tell people about it. Right? Uh, let me see. I have... <clears throat> now, the dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are of two types. Right? 
actual events or symbolic? We see that the dream Yusuf alayhi salam has just had, is it actual event or symbolic? It's symbolic, right? He's seeing stars and sun and moon and all. And uh, uh, a lot of, uh, later on as well, we will see in Surah Yusuf that he's going to have a symbolic dream. And this vision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this mubashira from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or ruya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never cause you to wake up frightened. It's not a scary dream at all, right? You will not wake up terrified or else it would not be a mubashira. So and a mubashir as it is from bash, which, is mean, which means glad tidings. Bashara, glad tidings, yeah? Even if it is positive, it is a factual statement. And sometimes it might not be 100% positive, but it is not like a scary dream. That's also important to understand. It might be not positive, but it will not be terrifying you at all. So you will wake up and remember a dream vividly. So it is not hadith al nafs, right? You will wake up in a terrified state. That is hol, a nightmare. If these two conditions are met, then it is very possible and likely are not met, then it is possible and likely that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you can, again, not tell 100% people like us. Yeah. Sometimes you wake up in a very neutral state. You're neither scared nor uh, feeling very happy or joyous or whatever. So that can also be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from shaitan. So dreams that are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be like actual events that you actually see something. Like uh, uh, I just gave you the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? And uh, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right before he got his nabuwa, for almost six months, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala narrates that he would see dreams every night and which would, the, the same thing would happen the next day, right? So those are like actual events. Even after he got his nabuwa, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saw that he's going for umrah. Right? And he told his companions, let's go for Umrah. And then the, the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah happened. Those of you who are familiar with Sira would understand that. So that was a real event. That was something which was actual. And the other dreams can be symbolic, just like we talked about uh, uh, the dream of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. And even Ibrahim alayhi salam actually saw that he was slaughtering a ram. Right? No, I'm not right. He, he actually saw that he was, no, that was a real dream. That was an actual event. He saw that he was sla slaughtering his uh, Ismail alayhi salam. Yeah. Okay. So what, sh what should we do if we have a bad dream? Yeah. What should we do when we have a bad dream? You don't have to guess. Yes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us a whole series of things that you can do if you have a nightmare. Seek refuge with Allah from the evil dream. Seek refuge with Allah from the evil of shaitan. A'udhu billahi mina shaitan rajeem. Spit on your left side three times. Dry spit. Like dry spit. Three times when you wake up or if you've woken up in the middle of the night, right? Change your position. Sometimes, you know, we are having a, we are like tossing and turning and at the back of our minds, we kind of, we are half awake and we are getting scared of something. Change your position, right? Or get up, make wudu and pray to rakat. Salah. Just literally get up from bed, uh, 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 make wudu, and don't mention it to anyone. So these are all of the uh, very practical advices that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us in case we have nightmares, right? Now, dream interpretation is also something which is of great interest to people. So people are going to all kinds of different, uh, I don't know, People claim that I can, you know, just like people claim that I'll do istikhara for you or I can look into the future. Another part of that is, you know, they call, call themselves alim and uh, there are different names that are given to them or some baba or whatever that I can interpret your dream. That's absolute rubbish. The reason it is absolute, absolute rubbish is that the... Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I forgot to change this for you guys. Okay. Uh, the reason it is rubbish is because this is something, this knowledge is something which is specially from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not a knowledge that can be learned from one person to the other. Right? Astronomy is something you can learn. Right? 
But astronomy and astrology are completely different things. Don't mix them up, right? There are many things, like for example, Sheikh Yasser Khali, who's a very uh, renowned scholar of our times, he said that I went to the University of Medina to do a proper, you know, his whole Islamic course and all. So there are many, many subjects that are taught, many subjects, but there's no such thing as interpretation of dream. So anybody who claims to be a religious scholar and says that, let me interpret your dream, is absolutely false. One of the most famous works that people quote is this Ibn Sirin's Dictionary of Dreams. He was a scholar from the Tabi'in, yeah? And this is totally fabricated. The reason that we are mentioning it in class over here is because you might have heard of it, or you might have the possibility of hearing about it if you go and Google interpretation of dreams. This is absolutely fabricated, written around seven, 800 years after his death by whoever somebody and claiming it to be his work. So this is really not true, right? So any book that you find, Dictionary of Interpreting Dreams, yeah, or, uh, you know, whatever you, you will find, and I'm talking about Islamic books also. So be very, very wary of that because this is not a knowledge that is transferable from one person to the other, right? It is not a science that can be taught people to people, yeah? And these are, according to scholars, this is one of the few sciences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either blesses you with it or doesn't. So like Yusuf alayhi salam, one of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him was what? The, this knowledge of interpretation of dream, dreams. And even people in our dunya, in our time, might do that, might have the capability of doing that. And how are you going to know that? Just by experience, actually. No, no other way can you find out. There's no degree for it or anything. So there is this uh, incident that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw a dream and he told it to the people, right? And this, please remember that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was who? He was a teacher also, right? He was the teacher of the Sahaba as well. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an raised his hand and said, Ya Rasulullah, I beg you by Allah to let me interpret this dream for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, okay, go ahead and interpret it. Abu Bakr took every symbol and said, this means this, and this means this, and this means this, and then asked, Ya Rasulullah, am I right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you are right in some, and you are wrong in others. And this is an authentic hadith in Bukhari. So this is not uh, something that we can doubt. So if somebody of that stature of Iman and Taqwa, like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, was messed up kind of in the interpretation of dream. So how can regular people think that they can claim that I can interpret a dream, particularly in our age, right? And the reason that we are spending time and talking about this is because this is also something that is used by certain very dodgy people claiming to be religious to actually draw people into their circle. And then they, you know, then they ask money for it. And then, you know, once you are in it, then there's no end to the thing. Then in ayah number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, If Allah Yusufu li abihi ya abati inni ra'aytu. No, sorry, huh? I'm just repeating this ayat because I want to talk about the, the, the end of it. Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban wa shamsa wal qamara ra'aytuhum li sajideen. Yusuf alayhi salam says, I have seen 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and I saw them, like, and he repeats it, I saw them move and prostrate to me. Now, Yusuf alayhi salam was a child at this time, right? And he did not understand the meaning of dreams at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not revealed that knowledge to him because he was too young, yeah? So when he becomes older, we know that, and we will see inshallah ta'ala in those ayahs, then, then he is going to be interpreting dreams when he is in prison. Okay. Um, like I said before, that he's saying, Ya Abati. This is a very polite and a very loving way of addressing your dad, right? Oh, my dear father, is what he's saying. And you will see that the other brothers who were older than Yusuf, salam, inherently, Yusuf salam, was a polite, sweet child. And some scholars say that obviously because he was a chosen one, he was going to be a prophet, right? So a natural inclination towards a child, oh, how many of you have kids? 
is there a natural inclination towards the child who's more polite more dutiful more you know your heart goes towards that child more than other it's not that you don't love the others it's just that you have that soft spot right sometimes for the one who's very polite and also sometimes for the baby of the house you know sometimes it happens can somebody wake her up yeah okay thank you no no it's all right i, I hope you don't mind but yeah okay I, i can understand why you can doze off that's okay so what happens what that these 11 stars represent his brothers and the sun and the moon represent his parents now some scholars say that the sun represents the dad and the moon represents the mom but other scholars and a lot of them say that no the sun represents the mother and the moon represents the father because a mother has three times more right on a child uh, on on the sun than the father her she has got three daraja over the sun so that is the reason they say that it's just a little point just for us to understand it makes us happy as moms <laughs> alhamdulillah allah which which is a fact which we whenever we talk about daraja we always remember the verse of the quran where it says that you know rijal has a daraja over the wife and then we never talk about the daraja that a mom has over the dad yeah and there are many many hadiths that are uh, related to this right so what do the sun and the moon and the stars represent celestial objects so high individual somebody we, we also in in, uh, in our english terminology somebody who's famous we call star so and so is a star right we all think we are star all stars sitting over here shining bright so what does this mean this means that they are prostrating these celestial bodies to yusuf alayhi salam so that means that his status his position is higher than those who are prostrating to him so allah subhanahu wa taala is telling him that no matter what happens from now till that period of time that this, this dream will come true which was approximately at least 40 years is what the scholars say from the time he saw the dream and from the time it actually actualizes <clears throat> and allah is preparing him from a very young age because he has to go through very severe trials from this period onwards literally so allah is preparing him that okay stay cool right you are the one who are going to be on top you are the one who is going to have a very elevated position even in this dunya even in this dunya right and yusuf alayhi salam did become more famous and rose to a very high rank even in terms of the world right and other than being a prophet as well theek hai and uh, his mother and his father and the brothers did not reach that level of nobility right then what happens is that when the father hears about this yeah that he says that i had this dream the father says to yusuf alayhi salam qala ya bunayya ya bunayya is also a very uh, loving term oh my child ya bunayya and you're going to see this ya bunayya in addresses of almost all the prophets that allah subhanahu wa taala talks about in the quran that the way they talk to their children right sometimes when i think about the way i talk to my children it's beyond embarrassing how do we talk to our children Yeah, how do you talk to your children? Maybe you guys are very polite. I know there are some mothers. There's a very, very dear friend of mine. She's so polite and so sweet to her kids that I'm like, how do you do it? <laughs> you know, seriously, because our kids have taken the brunt. Those of you who are not married, raise your hands. How does your mom talk to you? Um, Now you're a little older, right? How old are you, sweetie? Uh, you're 14 okay how does your mom talk to you i don't want to do you to do griba of your mom but do you get screamed at do you feel that she talks nice nicer to other people than you there you go all of our children are witness to that by the way oh my goodness yeah allah have mercy on our soul seriously we are not polite with our kids we are not and sometimes we feel like we are polite but not really the tone of voice is very like you know my my young youngest is 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 a, is a very clever one like right? she said she says your tone does not match your words <laughs> amna amna says that to me yeah. no no i'm i'm not buying this amma <laughs> your tone and which is true i am telling you that right? again i can't speak in urdu so bam now beta get up and that just that beta is like a dagger absolutely 
right? So this is just this ya bunaya. I think all of us need to practice that. Okay, let's do that. This is Ramadan. We are reading this beautiful address of Yaqub alayhi salam to his uh, uh, son. Ya bunaya, right? I, I, I'm afraid if I say that to my children, they'll probably. I have something to say. Huh. 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 A friend, dear friend of mine, likes to say that she talks to her children like in the most polite manner yeah. ever. Like when she used to pick up the kids from school and the way she talks. Because uh, yeah, I, I'm sure as you know the same the same with Janu, right? Your husband. If you're very polite to your husband, he might have a heart attack. Poor thing. Aaj kya hua? What is the matter today? You have rosa lag You know you're probably feeling the fast or something. Yeah, but we need to make that effort, guys, because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's most distinctive thing was his akhlaq. Right? Most distinctive thing. And when we wonder that why is it that people are wary of Muslims, it's because we are so rude and batameez. Generally speaking, we are very rude and we are very batameez. And the sad part is that in Ramadan, where we should be working more on our egos and on our everybody's angers are flare, flaring. And, you know, particularly near Aftar time, if you go, if you drive around, Allah Akbar Kabira. The driving itself is crazy. Man. The driving yeah. itself is crazy. And sometimes at home when you're putting the star on, you know, you might be having 10 things going on, lot, lot, lot happening. And then you are like almost screaming at the kids. Yes. Almost screaming at the kids. You need to put the dates on because you're going to wait the sabab for the other person's rosa. You know, that, that is the tone of voice that you're using. You're like, oh God, no, 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 no. Yeah. So very important. Yeah, Bunaya. Just like you were saying, yeah, Abati. Look at the relationship. This just shows the closeness and the relationship of Yusuf alayhi salam with his dad. Because Bin Yamin is a little baby right now. So he's not in the picture, so to speak, in the equation. And then a few verses later, you will see how the others are talking to him. Yeah, You know, the difference in, in uh, kind of the way they are interacting with each other. Right. So he says, do not relate your dream to your brothers. Lest they should devise a plan against you. Surely, Shaitan is an open enemy for mankind. In the Shaitana Lil In the Shaitana Sani Odu Adu Mubi. So when his father says that, that they are going to be, you know, they'll they'll plot a severe plotting. Like in Arabic language, right? Fakaidu it's very difficult to translate what uh, what scholars say because we generally don't say that now that they are going to plot against you a plotting that is how it's going to be translated but what it means is that they are going to do something severe they're going to go you know cross limits in plotting against you and why would they do that because they're jealous because they have this element of envy and jealousy against yusuf alayhi salam and the little baby yami uh, bin yami right um What scholars tell us is that just from this one ayah, we can derive many, many benefits. So how we're going to go about in these sessions is that sometimes we're going to go and talk about the ayat in whole, or then sometimes we'll do like chunks of ayat and then talk about that, right? Uh, we only tell dreams to those whom we trust and only those dreams which are good dreams. Nightmares, just zip up. No need to talk about that, yeah? And of course, he was a child and his trust of his father was poor. And then we see the dangers of jealousy and envy over here. Right? The older brothers, and, you, and who, is, who is their dad? Everybody's dad. He's a prophet. So what kind of akhlaq do you think he had with his kids? Would he be discriminating against people? No, but when it comes to love, when it comes to inclination, even prophets can incline towards one more than the other. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about Aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a hundred percent just and loving husband to all of his wives. But he said, he said that this is a this is a, a sahih hadith that my heart inclines towards Aisha. And the others, the 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 the, the beauty and the uh, largesse of all the azwaj and mutahharat, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them, was that they didn't hold a grudge against her because of that at all. Of course, there was some friction here and there, particularly between Hafsa radiallahu anha and Bibi Aisha, but they loved each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was this healthy competition, obviously, for the attention of the husband and all, but the husband was such that he didn't pay less attention to the others, but he said himself, so that is the reason he wanted to be with her when he passed away, right? So when he was like that, so don't you think this dad is also like that? That his heart inclined towards Yusuf alayhi salam and the little baby. And the little baby, obviously, scholar says is very logical because the mother passed away during the childbirth. So Zahir, you know, the chota piddu, you can imagine, sweet little thing, yeah? So he did, and he understood the other kids as well. He understood that. And do you think that he would have been a little lax in their tarbiya, the ones who were older? No, we can't possibly even dream that a prophet would be like that or be outright discriminatory against them. No, but children are also clever. They can judge, right? Even if we look at our own children, they can judge that, you know, soft corner is for this one. Yeah, particularly the older ones always say, had I done this, I would be jammed by now. <laughs> you know, my, my elder one says that, you know, because the little, and it is true also that the little one gets away with murder, right? So you, you, you are, that's a very natural thing. But if our emotions are absolutely riding with our ego, then something which can be natural competition, you, if you want to call it that, between siblings and all, it goes to the level of very dangerous territory of envy and jealousy. That is a very important lesson in the childhood of Yusuf alayhi salam that we see. That the older brothers just let themselves go. And that fire of jealousy started burning. You need to quench that fire. yeah. And we need to learn that lesson in our households as well. right? A, do not be discriminatory outright. Because that's not fair. And even if you do have a soft corner, make sure that you have a special relationship with each child. And it could be a different special relationship, yeah? And jealousy is what? It is this burning desire. It is this, you know, the green-eyed monster, this burning desire that I should have what she has or he has. It's not like you see somebody with some good quality or some ni'ma or some beauty or nice clothes or a good position or you say, Ki, ya Allah, uh, you know, give baraka to her in that and give it to me also. That's one thing. Alhamdulillah, that's not a problem. But jealousy and envy is what? The hasad is what? Take it away from them and give it to me. You know, that, that is very problematic. That is very problematic. And sometimes in households, we have these fiercely toxic relationships, yeah? And it's not necessary to be between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. It could be between any family members, but we do see that quite often between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law because who is involved? The love and attention of that one person is involved, yeah? So the mother-in-law is plotting that he should only pay attention to me or the daughter-in-law is plotting that he should only pay attention to me. That's jealousy, actually. That is hasad. That, that is where the, the root cause of that is. Yeah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us <clears throat> I warn you, beware of envy, for it devours good deeds just as fire devours wood or grass. Hasad. It is such a toxic thing. And it is very interesting, this hadith. Because what scholars tell us is that jealousy is actually a feeling. It's not an act. It is a feeling. And we are not going to be accountable for our feelings and thoughts, except for jealousy and hasad. Because it is so all-consuming and it takes us towards 
very sinful and very awful and very sometimes uncharacteristic acts. We may not be horrible people. Like the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam were not evil, horrible people. But what they did was because they got so consumed by their passion of envy, right? They did not reign in their passion at all because that this is a destructive passion. We talk about uh, the diseases of the heart. Hasad is a very, very serious disease, disease of the heart. So what, what we need to do, what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us and what scholars tell us is that we need to fight jealousy. If you feel that I'm jealous of so-and-so, whether it's because of their looks, whether it's because of their money, whether it's because of like, you know, she's married to such a cute guy and I'm not getting married. It could be anything. It could actually be anything and be seemingly very small thing. Mom loves, loves my sister more than me. It could be anything that you, you, you think that now, okay, now I'm thinking about this too much. Why is this consuming me so much? Yeah. Even to the fact that they have better numbers than others. And this is the age of this kind of corrupt thinking. This is the age of that kind of corrupt thinking. Yeah. If we don't fight it, if we don't concertedly make an effort a, to make tawba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray for that person that you're feeling jealous of. Pray for that person. Tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbi, give barakah in their niyama. I talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I'm feeling a bit of a tinge. Stop it for me here. I don't want to go further ahead. Yeah? And all of you are aware of that. We all have these feelings, don't we? We all do, for some reason or the other. And generally speaking, we get jealous of people who are close to us. If we have come to that point in our lives that we are going to be jealous of somebody passing down the road, then we really need to get our heads examined. I mean, then we are heading towards some serious disaster. Yeah, then there's a very, very serious problem with us. Generally, it's friends, family, people that you know, right? That you tend to have these negative feelings for. The feeling of jealousy is going to eat up not just your good deeds, but your peace of mind you get consumed by it. If any of, all of us have been through an experience like that. Have you ever been to some, yeah, can, do you want to share it a bit? Um, I think we were going to ask about younger, so I have a brother who's nine years younger. Okay, you have a nine year, uh, a brother who's nine years younger. Yeah, all right. I have a nine so I was used to be the youngest child. So Baby, long, and then? And he was the only boy in the family. Oh, so yeah. He, I mean, I love him. Course, yeah. But in those days, you were scheming how can I push him down the stairs? No, no, not as bad as that. Not as bad as that, but it could get as bad. It could get as as bad as that. Yeah. But but you know what we're talking about. If you let it go, and you just let it fester like that wound, then it's going to explode. And that is what happened to Yusuf alayhi salam's brothers. Right. So very 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 important that this jealousy. We, we kind of see and acknowledge that, you know, I don't have positive feelings, right? Um, Sheikh Ibn Usaymin, he said that anybody who is jealous of somebody else is actually accusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of zulm and ignorance. He says it is, a, it is an aqidah problem because you think that, no, I deserve this and he doesn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is na'udhubillah bin anfa'i. That's exactly what you want, right? That you want that for yourself and not for that other person, right? But that can be very, very problematic. Very, very problematic. So I should have been the class monitor. And, and then you blame game, you start off with, and you start scheming about things. Little children do that, teenagers do that, older people do that, everybody does that. That is the reason that this is such an important lesson in Surah Yusuf. Right? So to say that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know, na'udhu billah, and I should have been prettier than Angelina Jolie or whoever. Yeah. So this is a disease, very, very serious disease, and a disease that we need to think about actively so that we can get rid of it. You know, there was this one sahabi who's from the Ashray Mubashara. Um, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced that these are the ashram, the 10 sahabi who were given the glad tidings of Jannah in this dunya. I forgot his name now, which one it was. Uh, so the other, because you see the sahaba were always very 
keen and very eager for brownie points, right? So he said, I want to spend the night. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that uh, 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 twice he had mentioned about that Sahabi that, you know, he's, he's walking by and said, if you want to see a person of Jannah. So this other Sahabi said, I want to spend some time with you. What is it that you do that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given you such amazing Bashar, right? So he said that uh, later on, the other Sahabi, he said that I didn't find anything special, yet. you know, his Rabadat or whatever, it was like regular, like, you know, nothing that I could pinpoint, ah, okay, so this is it. So then he asked him eventually, he said that, listen, that's why I'm here. I just made an excuse of wanting to spend some time with you. What is it that you do? And he also started thinking, he said, hmm, because you see, they weren't like, Acha, you want to know about me? Okay, so you don't, no, no, they were not like that. They had this very... Uh, real and truthful humility. He said, the only thing that I can think of is that when I go to sleep, I have zero bad feelings for anybody. Seriously, I have a clean slate for every. Can we say that about ourselves? We can't, unfortunately. And because of that, and that was his default position. No bad feelings, no negativity, no, nothing, nothing for anybody. That's a very huge thing. And he was given the basharat of Jannah because of that. It is such a big deal. So imagine what is jealousy? It is bad feelings on steroids. That's what it is, actually. So if we are not going to get rid of that, then forget about Jannah Vanna. That's That ain't going to happen. Our tahajjud, our fasting, our Qiyamul Layl is going to mean very little, right? So with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we get to know about the diseases of the heart, the whole idea is work on them, work on them. The other thing that scholars say, okay. sure. Mm -hmm. kind of gets into this unhealthy zone. Yeah. And it's like a domino effect then, one thing after the other, one thing after the other. Yeah. Imagine these guys, the brothers, they were going to kill him for God's sakes. I mean, talk about dysfunctional family. Yeah. And where did it start? It started with that they want, they thought the father loves them more, uh, him and Bin Yamin, he loves him more, so need, we need to get rid of him. Another thing that scholars say that we need to take from this ayah, these ayahs, these two, that a believer should be wise and not make problems from him for himself. Do not put yourself in a position where others will look at you and be jealous. Whether it in those days, back in the day, it used to be boasting. Then you're going on and on about your name. You're going on and on about how cool I am or whatever. And in a very realistic manner, you're not even meaning to, uh, you're not even exaggerating, for example. So for example, if you're an A-star student, you're an A-star student, right? So you've got all A-stars. You, you're, you're, you're the head girl or the head boy, or you've got admission in some fancy university. Alhamdulillah. That is actually, you're not exaggerating. It has happened. But when moms come to that point, that they are posting report cards of their children or social media. What are you asking for? You're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. You're posting videos of your fancy, fancy vacations all over the place. There's nothing wrong with that. You can afford it. Alhamdulillah, it is halal. Alhamdulillah. You share with friends and family. Alhamdulillah. But we, the, we, our, our generation, where we are going right now, is literally asking for trouble. So I'm just going to say it in Urdu with apologies to the two of you. You know, you're literally inviting trouble, inviting jealousy and the evil eye. And both are absolutely barha. Right? So that is something, and not that Yusuf Ali Salam was doing that, but since we are talking about jealousy, we need to know that don't put yourself in that position. Don't flaunt. This is flaunting. 
all kinds of stuff. I mean, people put pictures of their food on the, the social media. Yeah, very fancy restaurant. You're taking a picture. Yeah, you're sending it to your child. Your child is sending it to you. You're sharing on a family group. That's a different story altogether. But why do we need to be? We are living like Instagram lives. Everything you go to a restaurant, even you literally see people making a frame. Don't you, have you ever noticed that? Because why is it? It has to be Instagrammable. So they they call it something, na? Right? It's not called Instagrammable. I'm very, huh? No, no, there's a name. It's it's for the gram or something they say. You guys are young. What what? Uh, I don't know what. You, it's for the gram. Is that what they say? Yeah. So they kind of make this whole thing, and then you are not enjoying the moment. If, even if you're on holiday, you're more worried about that. Is that mountain coming in view or not? <laughs> Should I move this way? You know. And this is my good side. Yeah. When we were growing up, I didn't know which one. I still don't know which one is my good side. And these days, like ten-year-olds are like, oh no, this one is the good side, the profile or whatever. And all these aunties, please, ladies, put a lid on it. Duck faces don't look nice on anybody. Hmm. You look like a caricature of yourself. And now people have started making memes on that. That your profile picture, if you ever get kidnapped, Nauzubillah, they will never be able to find you because that's not what you look like. And if you're going to do that, whether it is a dinner in your house, whether it is a graduation party, whether it or weddings don't even get me started, then don't you think that you are causing the other person to look at you in a certain dodgy way, and then you are responsible if they get jealous of you? Then that is your issue. A believer doesn't do that. A believe believer doesn't ask for trouble, or put the other person in fitna. You're putting the other person in fitna. Ji Zaira. They say say mashallah. Sometimes I have to stop myself from being rude. Let me let me tell you that sometimes I actually have to stop myself from being rude. I cannot comment on this. That that's going to be like the height of badtamizi, right? But I really do want to say that. I said, take it off, na? What do you mean, say mashallah? I've also seen that say mashallah. Yeah, yeah, they are putting their own picture and then saying mashallah under it. What are you daft? <laughs> what is the matter with you, woman? And by the way, women do that a lot more than men. Yeah. Girls Instagrams and boys Instagram, very very different, very very different. Yeah, and because the whole culture is teaching us that you have to be out there, your worth is how many likes you get. Your worth is what 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 is your feed all about, right? So without thinking, that where do you think all of this? Everybody's not going to be happy for you. Marketing yourself for what? That is the thing. Now, what are you selling? You're selling your soul. That is exactly what you're selling, and that is what Shaitan wants you to do. You, you take your. You, you're not that cheap. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has created you the best of creation. Don't sell yourself like that for puny little, little price. Allah says in the Quran in many places, "Don't sell these verses for a puny little price." And that is what we do when our behavior, whether in person or on the media. Is like that, and because now we live media lives. To be very honest, everybody does. We need to be very, very careful, particularly in Ramadan. All the naked dini bibis. You don't have to share how many rakat tahajjud you did. You don't have to share how many times you finished the Quran or how many Quran classes you are going to. You don't have to put it up, and people put those up. Today I am doing tarabi on my balcony. <laughs> the the sun the 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 moon the, you know the 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 wind is going through. Hi, Hari. What? Focus on the taravi, na? How do you have time to take all these videos and all? I actually saw somebody's video just the other day. Abhi the past few days, somebody's video. They had actually put a video on doing taravi on my balcony and how cool it is, and I feel so close to Allah Taala. It's it's ridiculous. Do we even realize the ridiculousness of it? Right, so you Yaqub alayhi salam. Later on in Surah Yusuf, we are going to see that when they were about to enter Egypt, the 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 kids had grown up. 
young men, 10 beautiful young men, right? And he said, don't enter from one door. Yes. Huh? Because of Nazar. Right? That, that is, you take precautions as a, as, a, uh, as a believer, that you don't want to, and then actually you are responsible for the other person's state of mind. That's not good. That's not good. Okay. <clears throat> There's another uh, hadith of Sahaba, right? Sahaba also have sayings which are called uh, who said they, they said, help yourselves to achieve your goals by secrecy. Right? There's no need to, to, to kind of be uh, FM 101 constantly and, you know. The other thing that scholars say that we need to learn from here is, that shaitan is a clear and open enemy. Clear and open enemy. Let me just put the ayat on here so that you can see that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned the first human being about shaitan, Adam alayhi salam. Yeah. And the very first human beings are told this to make sure that they do not cause to be expelled from Jannah. And over here also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this ayat that Yaqub alayhi salam is saying what? That shaitan is your open enemy. Yeah. And do you know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that on the day of judgment, shaitan is going to say that I had no power over you. Right? I didn't really have any power over you. I had no control over you. I could only do one thing. I called you and I whispered to you. And then you replied. And then you opened the door with open arms for me. So don't blame me. It's, it's got nothing to do with me. It's you. Right? It's you only. So shaitan is not used as an excuse for committing sin. Shaitan is an open enemy, very, 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 very clear, right? And then Yaqub as a father is well aware of the nature of his kids, right? Not only is he a father, but he's also a prophet. So his wisdom is greater than normal parents' wisdom, right? He knows that they're not all the same. So he takes active steps to make sure that the siblings do not fall into a fighting or a rivalry situation, which is going to cause them harm. If this is what he does as a father, then we should do the same, not just with our children, but also with our relatives and our friends and people who know us. Yeah. If you think that there is um, an issue between your children or say, for example, a friend's group, yeah, so-and-so has got an issue with so-and-so, try to resolve it in any way possible rather than letting the other person get into the state of envy or jealousy. Or give good counsel to your children as well as friends who are having some issue that, you know, relax a little bit. Perhaps you don't need to flaunt your A-star so much because, you, for, for example, one kid is an A-star uh, uh, student and the other is not. So the other one will feel a little, you know. So make sure that you're not rewarding the one with the A-star so much in front of the other that the other first person starts resenting it. Little, little, very practical things, but these are important things that we understand. Yeah. And the other point that scholars say is very deep that Yaqub salam says to Yusuf salam, your brothers will plot against you. That's what he's saying. But he's saying after that, that shaitan is an open enemy. He puts the blame on shaitan. He's not saying that your brothers are wicked and evil, so you should be careful of them. He's not saying that at all. Right? He does not call the brothers enemies that he they are your enemies. Right? He said that shaitan will plot. They will plot and shaitan is the culprit. Right? Scholars say that this is very deep because it tells us how we should criticize others. Whether it is our own children, whether it is people that we know, it is an Islamic etiquette to remove the blame from them and transfer it over to shaitan as much as possible. Right? Always hate the sin, but not the sinner. Right? Because this opens the door for the sinner 
to come to astaghfar to come to tauba to come to allah subhanahu wa taala and that is exactly what happened actually with the brothers of yusuf alayhi salam yeah i understand yeah what 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 you are getting confused about is when you are talking about your own sin you have no excuse that this was shaitan and not me but when you are criticizing somebody else then you separate them from what they have done for hazrat yaqub's children for hazrat yaqub's children hazrat yaqub is saying to yusuf alayhi salam they are plotting against you right he is not saying that they are evil he is not saying that they are sinners he is not saying of course they are sinners yes but yaqub alayhi salam is using that prophetic etiquette to separate the sin from the person and the, those the, who who are these people they are both their children he is the son and they are the sons you understand yeah when it comes to your own reckoning you cannot blame shaitan but if you are doing islah of somebody your own child so you're not going to say and and that is the reason actually scholars say that you should never call your child shaitan say naughty or whatever other word you want to use but don't say shaitan even because it's become part of our way of speaking but we shouldn't because that we don't realize how evil and awful shaitan actually is right so even when you are doing tarbiya of your own child you're going to talk about say for example the child lied for example right so you're going to say this is a terrible thing to do you're not going to say you are a terrible person you are a liar you are going to burn in hell you're going to, you know all of that right and you're going to quote hadith after hadith saying that you know anybody uh, a zani can be a muslim and a patani falana can be a sharabi can be a muslim but a liar can never be a believer right you can say it in the best possible manner once the situation is a little diffused later on but you do not make the person feel that there is no hope for me left i am like a gone case so now that i have been declared a liar by amma so phir theek hai then i'll be a liar because that tends to happen but if you lie yourself there is no way that you can put the blame on shaitan you see the difference aisha just hope that they will you of course and you need to do that with any kind of person that you come across and you are trying to point something out to them you separate the sin from the sinner that is that, that is exactly what yaqub alayhi salam has done over here not that he doesn't know that the son, what the sons have done is terrible right he knows that but when you are criticizing yourself you cannot use shaitan as an excuse you see our deen we are the middle nation na we are the middle nation there are you have to put yourself on a different pedestal than everybody else when it comes to reckoning of your own self whether it's your own children whether it's your own friends whether it's somebody very very dear to you what you are about yourself is completely different from what the other person is about right and it's something that we need to learn it doesn't come to us like that that is why we have uh, sessions of knowledge and sessions of discussing what is in the quran discussing what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has taught us because that is how we learn the etiquettes of being a believer right when you criticize others for something they are doing it is the perfection of islamic etiquette to bring along shaitan in that sentence right that shaitan made you do it right don't listen to shaitan etc um so when the child comes right i know you got angry and it is not your fault shaitan caused you to do it right if i get angry and i am regretting it i say why did i do it it was me that's a difference there's a difference even with very very close ones as well and if you're saying that to the to a child for example or to a friend who's uh, to uh, angry say for example and if you say that right the shaitan made you do it you're not really that kind of a person how would that make them feel it makes them calmer it makes them better they're more open to apologize right Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You know? 
shaitan has come on you you say, leave leave him alone for a while and say aur billah amazing thing to do right rather than saying that you are shaitan there's a difference in that yeah yeah no but this is an absolutely amazing parenting tip because sometimes we just are ruthless with our kids when it comes to trying to discipline you know that's the word discipline that we use and we don't really know the the prophetic etiquettes of discipline right don't you think he knows what the kids are all about don't you think he's a prophet right alayhi salam D doesn't he want the best for them and eventually what happens because of his tarbiya and because of the way he dealt with this situation what happened alhamdulillah we will see as we go move forward in surah yusuf that tables did turn they did Uh, uh become very different from what they because they're not evil people majority of people in this dunya are not truly evil no matter what behavior they manifest right so we need to understand that and we need to behave with them accordingly yeah okay. the other point that scholars say which is very very interesting is that um regardless of whether yaqub alay salam is represented as the sun or the moon he is bowing down to yusuf alay salam who is his son did yaqub alay salam feel any jealousy no even though he is going to be prostrating to yusuf as well right why is that that's very interesting he feels no jealousy because it is the miracle of creation of allah subhanahu wa taala that is what uh, scholars say that the kind of feelings he has kept in the hearts of parents for children it is unparalleled by anybody else a mother or a father always if their hearts are not corrupt we talking about sound hearts they always want their children to be better than them to succeed more than them right so i have done a bachelor's i want my child to do a masters for example so i have got build up this business i might my child to take it that much more further so you know you all, we all want that for our children right we don't get jealous of the fact that um, yeah and if you are jealous of your children allah akbar kabira then the state of the heart is dismal then there is serious need for very very serious tasbih yeah because then you're In, in big trouble, really, in terms of your condition of your heart. So, what scholars say is that it is not possible for a father to be jealous of the son. He would want better. Always consider because you see, parents at the end of the day always consider their children to be an extension of themselves, whether we like it or we not or not. We do. So, this is my son. This is my child. You know, you have that pride also, right? So, Yusuf Al Salam tells his father, and his father feels no jealousy. in fact his father feels like oh my god this is my child you know right so uh, and the father feels a sense of protection he feels protective towards him yeah um the miracle of creation of parents being so loving towards their children i hope we understand that when parents are in old age and being cranky and difficult and driving you completely up the wall right and perhaps they are not fasting and they want their lunch and they want their breakfast and they want their whatever you know it happens in households where you've got elderly parents that they're not fasting and you are like oh my god now i have to go to the quran class now after that you give your like getting all short about it no think about the fact that the relationship of a parent and a child is exclusively the most amazing relationship that allah subhanahu wa taala has created it's a beautiful relationship if we only see it at that and what scholars say that this shows us the perfection of allah subhanahu wa taala right okay now another point which uh, uh, a scholar had which is very very interesting is that when ibrahim alay salam the grandfather of yaqub alay salam and a great grandfather of yusuf alay salam he is saying to his father ya abati he uses exactly the same words right and he is saying to his father i have been given given knowledge that you have not been given and his father takes offense to that there's a difference here right yaqub alay salam knows that yusuf alay salam is going to be given something which he has not been given although he's a prophet and uh, ibrahim alay salam's father was not a prophet and the son is saying that i have something that you don't and he has a problem with that that shows the corruption of the heart 
right? So that is why, alhamdulillah, the, the uh, 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 Sheikh Yasir Qadi had made this parallel that understand the difference over here. That how, because alhamdulillah, those of us who are parents and those of us who are children of parents need to understand this dynamic, yeah? So, um, yeah, so that is the difference over here. Achha. Now, Yusuf alayhi salam did not tell the dream to his uh, brothers, we know that, right? And without telling the dream to his brothers, the jealousy had reached such a peak that they did what they did. So imagine had he told that dream, what they could have done would have been much worse, right? So that is another thing that take heed of what the prophets are telling you so that you might feel that no, maybe this is not such a cool thing to do, but in the end it actually is because it saves you from a lot of hassle and a lot of trouble. Oh my God, it's five o'clock already. Okay, we are going to stop here. I, I thought we were going to finish the childhood thing, inshallah, we'll try to speed up from tomorrow. But beautiful lessons, you know, you just cannot move forward without talking about that because a lot of times what happens is if you do a lot of verses together and then you come to the lessons and you lose the context. So inshallah, inshallah, tomorrow, inshallah, with Allah's help, we will try to finish all of the childhood uh, uh, age of Yusuf alayhi salam. And once again, request, please, please, please make special dua in your duas for all of us, our community, little community here and all of our Zoom community, because these are the nights of dua. These are the nights of our own personal abada, alhamdulillah. But we should never be selfish that we forget about our friends and our family. And when we are sitting together, right, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, in front of his book, then that relationship becomes the most precious relationship, actually. Even though we may not know each other that well. But our relationship because of the Quran, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becomes like that. And we literally have emotional feelings for each other. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that you are going to be with the one you love. Right? You and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given glad tidings to those who love each other simply for the sake of Allah. No other reason. There's no other ulterior, ulterior motive. Right? That, oh, they're going to invite me for dinner. Right? They're going to send me some nice gift. Nothing just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the sofi to be those people who love each other simply for his sake alone and make dua for each other in these precious days and nights. Inshallah. Ameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Allahumma rabbana ja'alna minhum alladheena amanu wa aminu shalihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr Ameen ya rabbil alameen ya ghafuru rahim ya arhamu rahimeen ya zal jalali wal ikram Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh